First of all, we would like to thank, uh, you should come a bit closer, otherwise, yeah. Um, we would like to thank uh, our great uh, project manager, Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, and also Claudia Dorfmuller. Um, as uh, you probably know, and I know that a lot of people of you have been with us at the previous events, uh, the Disruption Network Club is an ongoing platform of event and research focused on art, media, and disruption. And we are now at our uh, 12 conference under the title Terror Feeds Inside the Fear Machine. And uh, with Mauro, we have been working a lot <laughs> to reach this point. It's basically almost two years that we are researching for this conference uh, that has not been so easy to prepare. Uh, both in terms of content, but also in terms of funding. Uh, so we really worked a lot uh, on that, but we managed. So I'm really happy that we are finally here on stage presenting our second day. And also I would like to thank our funders, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, and uh, the grants that we uh, got provided by Neo Philanthropy, the Mozilla Foundation, the Berta Foundation, and the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. Uh, we also want to thank uh, the Radicalization Awareness Network that uh, supports uh, uh, the presence uh, of Michelle that we will see in the uh, next panel, um, Michelle Hassan, and also the Open Society Justice Initiative. Um, then a big thank goes also to our cooperation partner, the Kunstrand Kreuzberg Betanien uh, Spectrum, where we did our pre-event, uh, and Supermarkt Berlin, where we will have our workshop tomorrow. Um, so I repeat, please remember to register to our workshop. I'm just repeating it all the time. And uh, uh, we have then a collaboration partnership with the Alexander from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and also media partnership with Ex Berlin and, and Furterfield. So as I say, we decided to call this conference uh, Terror Feeds Inside the Fear Machine. And uh, the topic of the conference, uh, as you already saw yesterday, is an analysis of ISIS and its media strategy, the meaning of cyber jihad, and also why people enroll as foreign fighters. And we are actually starting exactly with this topic, uh, with a panel that is called Radicalize, the Franchise of Terror, uh, that uh, is going to be moderated by Dave Keating that Mauro is going to introduce to you. So good afternoon to everybody. I would like to uh, invite Dave Keating, that is the moderator of our first panel, to the stage. Dave is a US journalist, he's based in uh, Brussels, Actually, is corresponding from Brussels for Forbes, Politico, Deutsche Welle, and he is the former uh, editor of EuropeanVoice.com. He founded the blog Brussels to Berlin, and as a broadcast journalist, has worked as a line producer for a weekly newscast and a show producer for news magazine specials. Holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from New York University in Film, Television, and History, and a Master of Science in Journalism from Northwestern University. Thanks very much, Mauro. Uh, I'd like to call up our panelists on stage. We can go ahead and get started. So uh, as Mauro mentioned, uh, my name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist covering European politics in Brussels, and I'm going to be guiding you through this conversation where we're going to be talking about radicalization. Now, as we heard last night, the Islamic State is something that really strikes fear into the hearts of people here in Europe and certainly around the world. It's partly that people's imaginations can imagine it to be something bigger than it is, like we heard last night. But it's also, of course, the gruesome images and activities that we see shared on social media, as we've been discussing. But the other thing that really alarms people here in Europe is the fact that our people within our society are joining ISIS. These are people that are our neighbors. It could be somebody standing next to you on the metro. And that's a really chilling thought. So what we're going to talk about in this panel is what is motivating people to uh, give up everything and become a foreign fighter. What is motivating people uh, to be susceptible to some of the radicalization um, messages that they are receiving online. And also, 
what might become of these people when the war in Syria ends and they return to Europe. So we're very lucky to be joined by uh, two very distinguished guests who can walk us through this. Uh, so to my right, we have Saoud al Zaid. He's a scholar of Islamic studies at the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures. Uh, he's a, generally a scholar of radical Islamic thought and governmental reactions to radicalism. He specializes in the writings of Saeed Qutub and their influence on the Salafists in Central Arabia and the Gulf. He holds degrees uh, from the University of Chicago and Georgetown in the US. And he completed his doctoral dissertation in Islamic studies at the Free University Berlin that was entitled Modernity's Other, an Intellectual Anthropology of Radical Islamic Thought. And then to my left, somebody else from Belgium, Peter van Osteyn. He's a historian and Arabist and a PhD candidate at the Catholic University of Leuven. Uh, he studied medieval history with a specialization in the history of the Crusades, also from Leuven in 1999, and Arabic and Islamic studies, focusing on the history of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi and the assassins. He has been analyzing the conflict in Syria since its outset in 2011. And in 2012, he began reporting on foreign fighters and extremist groups. In 2015, he published his first book, From the Crusades to the Caliphate. And so, Saud is gonna be able to give us an anthropological perspective, a big picture perspective. Uh, and Peter is gonna be telling us about some of the, the specific cases that we've seen over the past couple of years. So, so Saud, why don't we start with you? Um, what is your general perspective from an anthropological perspective about why people are becoming radicalized? Uh, thanks a lot, Dave, for the introduction. Um, my talk today, I want to do a demographic breakdown of the fighters of the Islamic State. Uh, my goal is to, is kind of dissecting ISIS into smaller and hopefully more understandable constituent parts. Roughly speaking, um, I generally give two kinds of talks. On the one hand, I would describe like a majority of my talks as being of a general or theoretical nature. It's an answer to the question, how should I, an informed citizen of this world, think about when I want to think about Islam and contemporary political violence, like broadly speaking, in the lens of Islam as a religion. The other kind of talk I give is more of a strategic data dump. Uh, I show pieces of data, persons of interest, historical events, statistics, um, fashion, objects, weapons, and something rather material, something you can point to. And I try to string together a narrative based on a theoretical point but um, I never make it explicit because I try to let the data take, take over. When people want to talk about the ideology of the Islamic State or how it inspires attacks, it's the first kind of talk they want, something about theology, Quranic studies. But when they want to talk about the Islamic State as a state or as an insurgency that managed to control territory about the size of France, it's the second kind of talk they're after. What I'm about to show you next really collapses the dichotomy I just built and may very well be fake news. So, um, do you know what this is? This is uh, supposedly a passport issued by the Islamic State. Uh, American think tank guys get really kind of emotionally going uh, when they discuss things like how the Islamic State issues currency, the um, Islamic dinar, uh, and have the audacity to print passports. Now, I'm not absolutely sure this is real. There are a few things that, uh, that point it to maybe be a fake. For example, the Islamic iconography with pointy symmetrical lines, it's kind of more of a Persian, Iranian thing. And really, the passport to paradise text in the bottom seems a little too jokey. Um, but let's abstract a little bit. If you were in the administration of the Islamic State, say in 2015, it makes sense that you want to issue IDs like any state. You can gather data, vet applicants, literally put a face to a name and a birth date. It's logical that they need to issue passports. But now imagine you're a recipient of one of these passports. What the fuck are you gonna do with this document? Like, friends from the Muslim world often complain about how shitty their passport is, like if they're from Sudan, Yemen, Pakistan. But imagine you have this. This is your passport. Really, heaven is the only other destination that'll take you because you're already in hell. But this, the system of passports and inspections, checkpoints, stress, and scrutiny, is why we have the Islamic State. 
It's where you end up if the rest of the world has forsaken you. It's where you go if the current world is a massive disappointment. When discussing the fighters of the Islamic State, you have to think in terms of like your scope or your frame of reference. How are you analyzing them as individuals or as members of particular but different societies or even as different cultures within the Islamic State? We have to start with what they all have in common. Support for the Islamic State is of course the obvious thing, but I want to be more specific here. It is dissatisfaction with the current world order and perhaps the most defining feature, support for violent action in expressing that dissatisfaction, not just in Iraq and Syria, but abroad as well. This is what makes the Islamic State and its supporters politically radical. But now, how do we make distinctions between fighters? Or how is their dissatisfaction different due to their backgrounds? One way to look at it, which in my opinion is the most kind of objective way, is to ask, are the fighters from roughly the area they were born, where they grew up and have family ties? And I'm not just saying are they Iraqi or are they Syrian, but rather are they from Enbar province, or did they move north, or are they really from Mosul? And for this, uh, we actually have very dodgy statistics. No one's taking a census. At best, we have, uh, I have personally impressions from refugees who come from those areas or translators and fixers who go along with journalists. And even those guys who sometimes uh, know Arabic have no idea how to distinguish between a guy from Fallujah or a Yemeni. And sometimes the guy from Fallujah or Yemen would have the same last name or come from the same tribe. You know, they'd both be Qahtani, for instance. About half the ISIS fighters are native. Overall, I think it's safe to say that there are more Iraqi native fighters than Syrians. The Syrian bloc of fighters is basically Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, which I discuss later. And um, Syrian supporters seem more inclined to allow ISIS into their neighborhoods, usually because the Islamic uh, State is seen as a better uh, alternative than uh, otherwise. Uh, as a Syrian friend once told me, we're just giving chaos we are living under a name. On the other hand, young Iraqi men join ISIS. And the question is to ask is why? We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. So if you couldn't make out what uh, the 60 Minutes interview uh, was asking, the interviewer was asking that because due to economic sanctions, the United Nations released a report that about a half million Iraqi children died because they didn't have sufficient uh, medical equipment and uh, there was a cholera outbreak in Iraq. And she was asking Ma then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright if the price was worth it and then Albright said yes, it was. Um, that, that very year, actually, in 96, Osama bin Laden uses this figure uh, in his first statement against the United States. This was something that resonated in the Arab world. You can't talk about Iraq, current Iraq and Iraqis without the context of the 1990s. The average age of an ISIS fighter is 26. If you are an Iraqi born in the 90s, statistically speaking, you're very lucky to be alive. But even if you survived, you've also lived under some of the most distressing situations in recent history. Just think of the aerial bombardments that they've experienced from Desert Storm to, in 1990 to Operation Desert, uh, Desert Freedom, uh, Iraqi Freedom in 2003. From carpet bombings to surgical strikes, Iraq has now surpassed Germany as the most bombed place in the world. It, and literally, a slow burning economic sanctions under a brutal dictatorship over a decade then a land invasion followed by inept American-led reconstruction. Since 2003, over 200,000 people died in Iraq directly due to the conflict, and this is still, I think, a very conservative estimate by the Watson Institute and, and Brown. That was your childhood, your youth, and now your adulthood as a young Iraqi. Hundreds of thousands, mostly Sunni Iraqi males, have been detained in overcrowded prisons managed by American military contractors without trial. Besides Abu Ghraib, there was Kambuka, which uh, Sue talked about yesterday, which held 24,000 uh, inmates at its peak. Uh, I've read that more than 100,000 inmates have gone through Buka, 
and you still have four other major Iraqi uh, uh, American prisons in Iraq. Prisons is where the Ba'athist commanders met the Salafi Mujahideen, and it's really um, these Iraqis who set up the core of the Islamic State to transition from an insurgency to a territorial state. But it is also this moment that they probably decided on al-Baghdadi to be their leader, uh, which, I'll, which will have some serious consequences later. Among ISIS members, this is the most basic but also drastic distinction. Um, do the radicals have Muslim backgrounds when they were born, or was Islam a religion of choice, something they came to later in life? And um, in, in some ways to think of it, comparing them to the Iraqis, these are the ones with the least immediate reasons for joining the Islamic State, right? Like they, they didn't have to be in Iraq and Syria. You may have read the story of John uh, Georgelas, uh, also known as Yahya al-Bahar Rumi. He's an American of Greek descent uh, from a military family that became a prominent member of the uh, Islamic State propaganda machine. In some ways, he's exceptional. For instance, he gained Arabic fluency rather quickly and apparently is masterful in Islamic texts. But on the other hand, his story fits a particular mold that we see over and over again. He starts out as someone who felt deeply alienated from his society, his family, and he reacted uh, by partying hard and drank, drinking a lot of alcohol and doing drugs. Um, but this pattern, a seemingly lost but angry young person who parties hard and then finds Islam and sobers up for the first time, is something you see repeated, and there's even historical precedents, precedents like Malcolm X. Um, they start associating the benefits of sobriety with Islam, and uh, that anger that they had becomes a kind of dynamic zealotry. Um, Though mostly white uh, and mostly males uh, convert, there are some notable women like Sally Jones from the UK, an ex-punk rocker who brought her son to join ISIS. Um, though many converts come from the US and the UK, like it's in the low hundreds, they get a lot more attention. There's more from Western Europe, uh, Germany, Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Uh, the French and Belgian case I'm going to leave for my colleague here, and it's definitely a special case that uh, um, closer scrutiny needs to be held because they are numerically very high. Um, but as a whole, like many of the European, holding European passports actually do have Muslim backgrounds. Uh, foreign fighters from the West take on middle level to upper middle level positions, usually in propaganda or technical fields. But you also have ethnically white Muslims uh, whose families are originally Muslim, like the Chechens and Georgians, um, who are literally Caucasian, uh, and of course Bosnians. This is uh, Abu Omar al-Sheshani, who is actually from Georgia and the Black Sea, but his mom comes from Chechnya, Chechnya so. Um, he was trained actually uh, as part of the moderate Islamic rebels against Bashar al-Assad by the Americans. And the second he crossed the border into Syria, he joined Jabhat al-Nusra. And he was apparently pivotal in them integrating into ISIS. Guys like him are interesting because they often bring a lot of experience from their own conflicts. Uh, in his case, he fought in the Georgia, uh, Georgian army against Russia. For those with a Muslim background, they all, in a sense, have to go through a conversion of sorts, at least the bay'a to the Khalifa al-Baghdadi, which we'll discuss kind of in more detail in a bit. But the big distinction is Arab versus non-Arab. And this is what makes the Islamic State different from Al-Qaeda, which was more suspicious of non-Arabs uh, uh, wanting to join. So even Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is Blushi or Baluchi, but culturally uh, Gulf Arab, so to speak, was given a hard time in the organization, and he was the architect of 9-11. Um, Al-Qaeda generally trusts Arab from the Gulfs, Egyptians, uh, Palestinians, more so than anyone else. The Islamic State started out with more Jordanians, uh, and the connection to Zarqawi's followers is interesting, but it's also a different organization than the one it became. Uh, but much of the bulk of the Arab foreign fighters comes from Tunis. And even though those holding European passports, many of them have Tunisian or North African roots. Uh, this is, of course, particularly interesting because the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring, started in Tunis. And it's often cited as the success story of the Arab Spring. But I think it reflects that we don't completely understand what's going on over there. And you really can't talk about the Arab side of ISIS without talking about the Arab Spring. The disappointments for the Islamic side beyond just the brotherhood in Egypt was massive. 
there was a lot of people in the Gulf who was eager to fund the jihad in Syria against Bashar al-Assad. And there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, uh, one of these has to do with that the Sunni tribes in the Gulf actually extend into Syria. So uh, there are tribes that have like affiliation with um, fam family members in Syria. Uh, and they really have no love for the Alawite regime uh, uh, in power. There were huge fundraising campaigns in Kuwait uh, and the rest of the Gulf, and it didn't make sense to me at the time, but I realized that raising money against the Bashar regime was uh, the only allowed form of jihad fundraising that was allowed by the Americans in the Western world. Because at the time, they too were supporting the moderate Islamic rebels, like the people who joined Jabhat al-Nusra and eventually joined into ISIS. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi presents a real dilemma for the Islamic State. On paper, they have a leader with religious credentials as he graduated from the Faculty of Theology in, in Jamaat Saddam, Saddam University. But these credentials and his ambiguous kind of ethnic background doesn't pass muster for the Salafis of the Gulf. For them, he went to a bad school and comes from a non-prestigious family. In the Islamic State, the majority of Gulf Arabs are Saudi, uh, and these are guys who do the nasheeds and most of the Arabic audio. You can hear it from their accent. It's kind of like the uh, religious accent around Riyadh area, the suburbs of Riyadh. But they're also, the Saudis are also in charge of collecting funds from the Gulf and bringing them to the Islamic State. Um, their main audience in the Gulf is very much into dramatic displays of violence against kuffar. But theologically, they're really uneasy about um, uh, al-Baghdadi being the guy, being the, the Khalifa. Abu Bakr, in a way, plays better for the non-Arab audience than he does for the Arabs because there's this kind of um, feeling in the greater Islamic world of missing the glory days of the Caliphate, even the Ottoman Caliphate. Um, after the oath of allegiance to al-Baghdadi in June 2014, the Gulf countries rounded up many Salafi uh, ulama who were usually pro-jihad. Their governments forced them to renounce ISIS by writing theological treatises against the concept of the caliphate. What these guys did was really interesting because they followed orders but kind of with a twist. Instead, they gave the Islamic State a new set of theological instructions of how to operate. And I'm going to kind of simplify here, but they want to downplay the role of the Khalifa, the Caliph, and build up the state. Make him a mysterious figure, kind of like bin Laden post 9-11, uh, more a voice than a figurehead. And I think it's not just fear of a drone attack, but it's also that they were worried that the funding from the Gulf and support from the Gulf would dry up. So you, you notice that after Baghdadi's rise, he quickly kind of goes into the shadows. The strategic logic for the Gulf Salafis is that if the Islamic State ever reaches their borders, they were going to take up kind of leadership positions uh, to theologically restructure the organization to a more orthodox kind of uh, order, maybe more like Saudi Arabia could have been without the monarchy. This is kind of the stuff you can glean from the text that they were writing. I want to end with kind of like the most important demographic uh, of the Islamic State, which is the stateless. This is Jihadi John, whose real name is Muhammad Mwazi of Lufiri. He was born in Kuwait in 1988, but his family was part of the Bedouin minority, or the stateless that come from tribes or families that have links in Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Saudi. Uh, uh, but for a variety of reasons, they never were able to get passports in any of these states. And so they occupy a kind of limbo status. Muhammad and his family moved to the UK in 94 and they had asylum there uh, where he was by all accounts a very good and, and, and studious kid. He was shy, considerate, and maybe a little dorky. Um, after graduating college, he went on a safari trip to Tanzania and on his way back to the UK, he was interrogated quite harshly by MI5 as they thought he was in Africa to receive military training from a shabab. This experience was so scarring, he decided to move to Kuwait and work there. Um, it's very unclear, but it's, it sounds like the British intelligence caught up with him in Kuwait and pressured the Kuwaiti government to deport him. Since his tribe, the Avlafir, could, not, could also be found in Syria, it was literally the only place that would take him. So he was shipped over, deported to Syria at just the beginning of the Arab Spring. Forsaken and forgotten, 
he joined, we don't know the entire narrative, but he clearly joined ISIS. And to the best of our knowledge, he is the person who beheaded, who beheaded uh, John Foley. Suffering comes in many forms, but institutional brute force, the one that's covered by passports and paper documents, like the Declaration of Human Rights, can be the cruelest form of hypocrisy when not applied. I don't mean to get meta, but it's hard to avoid this situation. People usually talk about how the Palestine-Israel is the central problem in the Middle East. Um, Arabs like to do this a lot. Or they talk about how the Shia-Sunnah split uh, uh, is really the, the defining conflict of the Middle East. Americans like to do this. Or they talk about the rentier state and underdevelopment and business people love to talk about this. But it's safer to say there are a lot of problems that are playing themselves out with the radical expression of the Islamic State. Instead of predicting what comes next in the world of radical jihad, how about we work towards fixing those things we already recognize as broken? I'm gonna end with a um, kind of a funny thing. This is the coat of arms for the Navy Battalion who managed uh, uh, the Buka prison. Uh, they called themselves the Sand Pirates. It's one of those pieces of data that uh, uh, is really quite revealing. In the Arabic, it says dignity and respect, but the images are saying something else. This is nowhere near the solution. This is part of the bigger problem, and I'll leave you there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Saud. That's a great big picture look at what's going on. Uh, let's talk, turn to Peter now, where we'll talk about some of the specific incidents that we are well aware of, but some of the, the actual case studies and the, the history behind what happened. Peter? That's not all. Yeah? Okay. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you for the prequel, it was very interesting. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, basically the convoy of Belgian fighters and uh, their history throughout the conflict. I always start my talk with this slide, half of uh, jihad is media, as we saw yesterday in the excellent presentations of Ayman Atamimi and Charlie Winter, media is extremely important um, within the functioning of the Islamic State and other um, jihadic network groups. Um, you could say for this particular conflict, half of uh, jihad is social media, and we will clearly see the influence of, of social media um, in the recruitment of Belgian fighters. This is a, an example <coughs> of a picture that was taken on a football field in uh, The Hague. Um, it was manipulated in Syria. Uh, they added a logo on the uh, top left, uh, they added the Twitter account to the right, and on the bottom they wrote down Min Holanda Munasir Ali Dawlat al Islamiyah, from Holland's support for the Islamic State. These guys were preaching in public on the streets of The Hague. Most of them have been locked up since. Another picture. Now, if we look at the Belgian network, we have an estimated total of 621 individuals that left or tried to leave uh, for the conflict in Iraq and Syria. Um, the most important networks in Belgium, Sharia for Belgium, with at least 101 individuals, Resto du Tawhid, which was, which was a kind of a sister network of uh, Sharia for Belgium, with at least 63 individuals, and then more importantly, the Zerkani network, which was a network of gangster jihadis, if you would like to call them like this. Uh, a clear example of the crime terror nexus, at least 85 individuals. Um, we can see a few waves in um, people leaving from Belgium. At first we have the, the hardcore uh, believers, the one who, um, when the opportunity arose, traveled to Iraq and Syria. Syria in the very beginning, um, to build a caliphate. But also you had some people who were rather naive and thought they were going to just uh, help the Syrians out, um, help them with medical supplies, um, food supplies, things like that. 
And you have the wave of the peer pressure. It's something that has go been going on since 2013 up till now. Um, those are the people who have been recruited actually via social media. Um, the presence of our Belgian fighters on uh, social networks like Facebook and Twitter was immensely huge. Um, I myself, in that period, <clears throat> uh, was on Facebook briefly for about four, four to five months. Uh, I pretended to be one of them. I called myself Abu Batal El Belgiki, um, and I just scanned their 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 bio. I scanned their networks. I hardly posted anything, but in the end, I, I ended up with uh, about 1,400 jihadi contact, uh, contacts, uh, guys from over all over Europe, actually. Um, and then, as soon as the caliphate was created on the 29th of June 2014, we see the hardcore caliphate fighters, people who leave uh, just to join the Islamic State and the caliphate. Um, <clears throat> overall, 478 people have uh, reached the conflict zone. It's a rate of si uh, about 77%. Um, 77 individuals have been lost. We don't know where they are actually. 45 of them were stopped abroad and a small minority, 22, have been stopped in Belgium. If we look at the geographical spread, basically you can see that the majority of these guys all came from the Axis uh, Brussels and, uh, sorry, Antwerp Brussels. They Basically, they, they preached, uh, Sharia for Belgium was very active in the city of Antwerp, they preached on the streets there as well, just like uh, the, the guys from The Hague. Um, they took the train south and they stopped in all major cities. They stopped in my hometown of Mechelen, they stopped in the town of Wilvoorde, and they stopped in the town of Brussels. And that's where the majority of all Belgian fighters came from. Uh, very, very few uh, foreign fighters come from uh, the western and eastern provinces in Belgium, strangely enough. Um, basically, here as well, you can see the importance of the networks. The hometown of Sharia for Belgium was Antwerp and Vilvoorde. Um, uh, the rest of the Tauhid network was operative in Brussels at the North Station. They were uh, organized primarily as, um, how should I say, an aid uh, group uh, distributing, distributing um, free food to uh, help, uh, needy Muslims. And the, <coughs> resto, uh, sorry, the, the Zerkani network was operative around Molenbeek and in Brussels Central. Um, if we look at how they organized themselves when they arrived in Syria. Uh, we know that 77 individuals joined Majlis Shura al Mujahideen, which later split up between the Islamic State and Jabhat al Nusra. The overall majority of Belgian fighters, 70%, uh, 284 of them joined the Islamic State. We know that uh, around 50 individuals, but probably a lot more, joined the ranks of Jabhat al Nusra. Uh, then, under the leadership of a uh, Syrian-French um, preacher, Sheikh Bassam al-Ayashi, 14 joined Sukur al-Sham, and 16 joined other groups, uh, one even joined um, the Syrian Arab army, actually. If we look closer at Majlis Shurat al-Mujahideen, this guy is Hussein al-Wasaki. Hussein al-Wasaki was a guy from Antwerp, uh, sorry, from Vilvoorde, recruited by Sharia for Belgium. Uh, he left very early in the conflict and he tried to join uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, it didn't work out as planned because nobody knew him, um, and so he got stranded on the border with Turkey. He roamed the border for about two, three weeks. And then he took his chances and crossed the border and uh, asked to Syrians to drop him off in the ranks of the Mujahideen. The two Syrians drove him to a camp of FSA soldiers who were drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. Hussein uh, became rather angry and he told them he wanted to, to uh, join the real Mujahideen and that's how he ended up in the ranks of Majlis Shurat al-Mujahideen. Um, as soon as he was, uh, as he joined uh, Majlis Shurat al-Mujahideen, he started recruiting via uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, 
Hussein himself was able to recruit between 100 and 200 Belgian and Dutch and French fighters for Majlis Shuret al Mujahideen. And in gratitude for that, the guy on the left, Abu Watir al Absi, who led uh, Majlis Shuret al Mujahideen, uh, named Hussein the Emir of the Muhajirin Brigade within his group. There are three main people who have played a crucial role in the, the creation of the Islamic State in Syria. So basically when ISI became ISIS. These three guys were one, Majli, uh, sorry, Majlis Shurat al-Mujahideen leader uh, Abu Atir al-Absi. On the other hand, the guy we already know, uh, Umar al-Shishani. And then there was another guy who nobody actually really knows. Uh, we've never seen a picture of him. Uh, nobody knows his national, nationality, but it's thought that he's uh, Dutch, Abu Ubaida al-Maghribi. These three guys uh, pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in person, and they left with him to, towards uh, Raqqa. Don't think he needs an introduction. Um, Katibat al-Batar al-Libi. Somewhere around the conflict, I... Basically, I stumbled upon a dead list. I was following, uh, on Twitter, I was following dozens of jihadi accounts, and one of them was called um, something Muhib al-Shuhada, the, the lover of uh, the martyrs. And that account posted uh, a dead list of um, people who had got killed in their ranks. And the majority of the people on that list were Belgian fighters, uh, to, my, to my amazement. I never had heard of Katibat al-Batar al-Libi before, except for a, a short piece that was written by Ayman Tamimi, Tamimi on his blog. Uh, that's where I also found the logo, uh, the, the sword of the prophet, Katibat al-Batar. Uh, at the bottom it is written, Adawlat al-Islamiya fil Iraq wa Sham, by the way. Katibat al-Batar al-Libi started as a national brigade, um, somewhat actually recruiting Libyan fighters, and because of the language bond with uh, a lot of the, the Belgian migrants, the, the Belgians, uh, most of them of Moroccan origin, uh, joined Katibat al-Batar al-Libi. Um, we shall see later on that Katibat al-Batar al-Libi played quite a crucial role in the attacks in Europe later on. Um, I don't know if he needs introdu introduction. Um, I don't think so. This is uh, our most renowned uh, Belgian foreign fighter, Abdel Hamid Abaoud. He joined Katibat al-Batar al-Libi um, and became very, very active on social media. He only arrived, he was in Syria for about a week and then there was a grisly video of him uh, towing uh, in a jeep around 10 to 15 bodies of uh, Kurdish fighters uh, after his jeep. He was joking, he said, well, back in Belgium, we used to tow um, bricks and stuff, but look at how my Jeep is organized, I'm towing something else. All of these guys, except for one, the guy with the, the frizzly hair um, in the white robe, the other ones are all Belgians. The guy in the, the white robe, is, we already saw him before on uh, the picture of um, uh, Abu Atir al-Absi, the guy on, uh, in the white robe is uh, Abu Abdullah Guitone, a guy from France who became very, very influential on social media as well, and who himself recruited a lot of people before he got killed. Um, here are the names of the guys for whoever would be interested in them. Most of, the majority of these guys all, all, um, have been killed, by the way. Um, this is also the period where, um, well, the influx of foreign fighters became huge um, from France, from Belgium, Holland, and go on. Uh, this is an example of a group of women who drove all the way from France in a white BMW um, towards the Islamic State, and they posed with their car. No idea what happened to the car, but seems like a quite a nice vehicle. Enter the period of the so-called Five Star Jihad, when there were actually headlines in the international media saying that the Islamic State was recruiting young girls and guys with pictures of kittens and jars of Nutella. 
Even at, at La Vache Kiri, if you can see in the background of our Belgian fighter, there they had La Vache Kiri. They wanted to show the world that they had anything they wanted. Life was beautiful, life was great. Um, they were living in palaces and villas with swimming pools. As you can see on this screen grab, this guy is singing a nasheed. Um, we dubbed this the swimming pool nasheed. Um, this guy was singing, singing a hymn while the guys in the background were playing water polo in the pool. It was one of the weir weirdest Nasheed productions I ever saw. This guy, uh, I had a lot of contact with him. Um, Dutch-Turkish foreign fighter Yilmaz, Israfil Yilmaz. He was a guy who first uh, served in the, the army in Turkey, um, later migrated to Holland served in the army in Holland and then left and became a trainer. Um, and he was very active on uh, Instagram using the most horrible filters you can imagine. This is his, his transition. On the left you see him in a, the Turkish army, uh, in the middle in the Dutch army, and off, on the far right you see him as an ISIS fighter. Uh, at first, he always claimed that he never joined the Islamic State and he was a freelancer. He was training everybody who wanted to be trained in, in war. And I think he might have been right, but at a certain point, uh, when the infighting be began between Jabhat al Nusra and the Islamic State, he, um, yeah, he, he fled uh, east. He joined the Islamic State and uh, went living in Raqqa. Uh, he gave birth to a child there. Um, he was married to, uh, first to a Dutch girl who he later dumped and she returned back to, to, uh, to Holland. He married another girl, had one child with her, and now he's presumably dead. He has been declared dead by the guys of uh, Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, if I'm not mistaken, early January this year. I have no idea if it is correct, but I assume it is. The Islamic State of Digital Natives. I don't know if uh, I should explain the digital native uh, theory. Um, it's posed by one of our great IT gurus in, uh, in Belgium. Um, I know the man personally because I've basically I've been working in IT for 14 years already. The dig uh, digital natives are those who were born in the digital era. People who have grown up uh, using the internet, grown up using smartphones, grown up um, using digital cameras. Uh, if you show them um, um, the old black uh, uh, phones, they would have no idea what it was. The, 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 I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm talking about the backlight phones, the, the, the old monstrous uh, things. I, I, I used to know them. I'm 40 years old also. I, I knew when the internet arrived. I even remember how it sounded <coughs> when you dial up on the internet, the sound of a modem it was something quite particular. If you would, um, hear, well, play that sound for a group of young people, they would have no idea what it is. They, they would think something is dying or so. Um, these guys, as they were growing up as digital natives, they knew to how to use technology very well. So basically, when the Twitter purges started um, in 2014, it was like a game of whack-a-mole. Um, you suspended one account, and they came back with two or three new accounts within 10 minutes sometimes. That was the time when they wrote and published manuals in Arabic, highly detailed manuals, very technical, on how to create or hack even um, email, uh, sorry, Twitter accounts. Um, one guy was able, um, well, actually he's still a contact of mine, he's an Islamic State supporter. He's been able to, recently he hacked the account of uh, a Puerto Rican um, singer, some kind of a rap star uh, with over 13,000 followers. Um, I am pretty sure his 13,000 followers must have been scared to hell when they suddenly saw their Puerto Rican uh, rapper uh, tweeting out pics of beheadings and stuff like that. This is also a picture of Jihadi John, manipulated by the Jihadis. Uh, this is a screen grab uh, I got from uh, site Intel. Um, 
Well, the guy I just talked about, for one of his hacked Twitter accounts, this is one of the first pictures he, he published. He first deleted all the content of, of the old account, and then he said, I'm back with this picture. Junaid Hussein, another uh, Islamic State fighter, um, basically he's being called the father of the, uh, the hacking division within the Islamic State. He was married to Sally Jones, the, the punk star we, we saw in the earlier presentation. Got killed. Under um, the, the so-called cyber caliphate, <clears throat> they at a certain point were able to even hack the Twitter account of US Central Command which you can see at that point 109,000 followers. The first thing they tweeted out was a list of names, addresses, and whatever details they knew of American soldiers with a clear message, go kill them all. Um, US Central Command was never able to reclaim this Twitter account. They had to make a new one. So that, that's quite a hack for you. Uh, this is also the period in time when they created their, their, their own uh, mobile applications. Uh, this is an example of an AMAC uh, agency <coughs> Android application. They only, only created uh, applications for Android, by the way, because I think they kind of known that Apple wouldn't approve of an Islamic State uh, application in, uh, in iTunes. I don't think that would ever happen. But basically what this thing did, you downloaded it, um, you installed the, the, the thing on your phone, you copied the digital print, and basically then your phone became a hub for Islamic State propaganda. Basically what the application did, every time that a Mark agency posted anything on Twitter, it, the, the phone would pick it up and would send it out to all the social networks installed on the device. So throughout Facebook, Twitter, uh, everything you can, you know, Tumblr, Instagram, they used about everything they, they found. Um, well, at a certain point they found out technology wasn't their best friend after all. As soon as the <clears throat> Americans and others started using the, the signals of their devices to track them, uh, this happened, I, if I'm not mistaken, earlier this year. This is a guy from uh, Hayat Akhir Sham who had been killed by a drone. And on the left you can see the, the drone circling around, uh, around al Bab before the guy activated his phone. They found him and they took him out. This is um, a thing that has been shared by um, jihadi media. Um, thank you for not using a cell phone because they, at a certain point they realized that their signals were being picked up not only by the Americans but also by the Russians, the Israelis, the Syrian Arab army, name it, and they would be bombed to smithereens. The attacks in Europe. On the right side we see Tarek Shadaoun, more about him later. On the left side we see uh, one of these, uh, sorry, the Belgian fighters who uh, committed a suicide attack. The very first um, plot in, um, well, not the very first, but one of the very first plots in, in, in Europe, in Belgium actually, was foiled in January 2015 um, when they rounded up a cell of three jihadi fighters in the city of Verviers. Two of them have, had been killed at that point. These are the guys, or the majority of the guys, who committed the attacks in France, with in the center uh, Abu Omar al Biljiki, uh, Abdel Hamid Abaoud again, then <clears throat> a few other Belgian fighters, and two Iraqis, and a Frenchman. Um, do note that Salah Abdeslam, who played a very important role in the preparation and in the execution of the Paris attacks, is not on this slide, probably because he lived and he escaped, changed his mind, and went back to hide out in Molenbeek for the next four or five months. These two guys, <coughs> um, if I'm not mistaken, these were the guys who executed, uh, or sorry, were, were responsible for the foiled plot in Verviers. Now, enter <coughs> the Zerkani network. Um, 
Abu Sulaiman al Biljiki, better known as Ibrahim al Bakrawi, and Khalid al Bakrawi. Both of them killed themselves on the day of the Brussels attacks. Uh, Khalid al Bakrawi is, I would call him the epitome of um, the crime terror nexus. He was what I would like to call um, a gangster jihadi. Uh, back in 2010, uh, Khalid al-Bakrawi tried to rob uh, an exchange office in Brussels on broad daylight. Uh, the police intervened. Um, Bakrawi and his friends, they fled uh, by car and they opened uh, fire with a Kalashnikov um, through the window of the car on the police officers driving through the streets of Brussels in broad daylight. The mayor of Brussels at that time, he called it un fait divers. No kidding. It was just normal in Brussels. Khalid al-Bakrawi was later convinced to 10 years in prison, but as it is uh, usual in Belgium, he served a third of his uh, sentence, and after three years he, came, he, he was set free. The first thing he did was take a plane to Turkey, um, where he was caught by the Turks at the border crossing, or near, near Gaziantep, if I'm not mistaken, and he was sent back to uh, to Belgium, but basically Bakrawi played it very, very uh, intelligently and he asked the Turks not to send him directly back to Brussels, but rather to The Hague. So Bakrawi entered, in, uh, entered The Hague, took a train to Brussels, nobody realized he came back, and for the next four to five months he and all the other guys started preparing for the Brussels attacks. Um, a few examples of the importance of Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, um, the spokesman of the Islamic State. This is from his last speech, um, which was published on, uh, in um, early Ramadan uh, last year. This is where he actually predicted the end, the so-called end or the crumbling down of the caliphate. Um, Basically, uh, sorry, Al-Adnani's message was, you cannot defeat us. We will retreat in the desert. We will turn back to an insurgency as we were after uh, the um, American war in Iraq. They, basically, the whole message is, we will not be defeated. We will live on and we will continue. Um, the other uh, message is, well, we don't fear that we live to die. As my colleague already pointed out, they're on the way to paradise, so what to worry about? And then we have it here, um, kill a disbelieving American or European, and especially the spiteful and filthy French. Um, in any manner or any way, smash his head with a car, slaughter him with a knife, run him over with your car, car draw him down from a high place, choke him, poison him. Well, basically, we know what that led to. This is a picture of uh, the Promenade des Anglais in Nice. One guy um, just hired a truck and killed 85, around 85 people um, in Nice on, on the uh, French, French national holiday last year. Rashid Kassim, another ISIS operator, uh, at a certain point got shot in the kneecap and was immobilized and he got bored and he created himself a telegram channel called Sabre de Lumière, um, light sword. And basically he started recruiting guys uh, via Sabre de Lumière. Sabre de Lumière was his open telegram channel, but he also had his private uh, account w in which he talked to the guys who were inspired by Sabre de Lumière. You see here two, two, the two guys <coughs> who were responsible of the killing of uh, the priest in northern France last summer. These two guys never had met before in life. They didn't know each other. They only, the only thing that they had in common was that they were both members of Sabre de Lumière. Um, here you see some of the, the inspired attacks by uh, Rashid Kassim. On the left you have uh, the killing of, a couple of uh, police officers in their home, um, in northern France. Then you see uh, directly to the right of that Abdel Malik Kermish and Abdel Malik Petit Jean, those were the ones who killed the priest. Um, and if we skip to the far 
right, and that's an attack that luckily got foiled. There were four women who at a certain point parked a car stuffed with uh, gas canisters. They turned open the gas and they threw in uh, a burning cloth and they hoped that the, the whole thing would explode and thereby taking down the Notre Dame in Paris. Luckily, they used diesel, so they didn't really burn for really long. Uh, the attack was completely failed. Rashid Kassim was also the one who basically did what I did uh, back in 2013, 2014. He, he just scanned Facebook profiles. And that's how he came up um, with the instructions for his brothers of the Islamic State in Belgium and France to take out Belgian soldiers who were patrolling the, sea, the streets. Um, he had a lot of information about them. He knew where they lived, he knew their license plates, uh, he basically knew their whole life and he posted every single detail of them on uh, his Telegram channel. <coughs> um, when the Belgian government find out, found out, uh, basically because I reported it to them, uh, I was a member of Sabre de Lumière, I was observing what they were doing there, um, then, well, uh, Facebook, there were strict Facebook rules implied for, uh, um, for the, the Belgian army, actually. Uh, the, the panic was huge. It took them two weeks to fully, fully investigate the matter. Uh, and a uh, friendly uh, journalist I work with, he van Vlierden, he actually received a message. They had to wait for two weeks before they fully investigated the whole matter, before reporting anything on it. The Islamic State attacks in Europe went on. This is uh, the attack last year in Berlin on the Christmas market, again with a truck. Then we have the attack in Istanbul. At a certain point I thought that the directly ordered uh, attacks from the Islamic State, the highly organized attacks like Paris and Brussels were over, but then we had this one. Barcelona this summer. We may, may be lucky that this happened before the attack. Their safe house exploded. If it would, wouldn't have been the case, the, the attack in Barcelona would have been dramatic. Um, they stored around 100 kilos of TATP in this house and was completely obliterated. Then, I'm very sorry for this graphic picture, I'm coming to Tarek Chadaoun. On the left, you see him as an ISIS fighter. On the right, you see him in Iraqi custody right now. The gruesome picture I just showed was the very first thing he posted on, uh, I think it was Facebook, one week after he arrived in Syria. He started boasting one week after he arrived, and he said, this is my, confirmed, my first confirmed kill. Um, everybody in Belgium was very much afraid, and there were rumors actually at a certain point, also spread by Rashid Kassim, that Jadaoun had been preparing uh, a new massive attack in, uh, in Brussels. Luckily for us, he was in Mosul, and he was captured alive there by the Iraqis. Um, well, nowadays we, we have these things. The, um, Luckily, they're not circulating on YouTube anymore, but they were abundant videos to be found everywhere and published by the Islamic State on how to make TATP just using basic ingredients. You could do it in your, in your home kitchen, and they actually showed that in a video. A very nervous guy was cooking TATP. Uh, you could see he was quite afraid because of uh, the instability of the thing. Well, if we look at the road ahead, um, the military defeat, very close. Iraq is completely free, at least that's what they say. Um, although the Islamic State still, still seems capable of high-scale attacks, uh, see what happened in Barcelona, there will be likely an increase of networked and inspired attacks in Europe. And then we, of course, we have the increasing problem of returning um, battle-hardened foreign fighters, uh, not only to Belgium, but uh, basically to the whole of Europe. And I'm afraid we will be haunted by um, 
whatever happened in the past for the coming maybe 10 to 15 years because basically um, in France, I, I think it was um, within two years, 60% of those convicted for terrorism since 2014 will have served their sentences and will re be released on the streets again. So the majority of these guys, they didn't de-radicalize. There's no such thing as de-radicalization. They kept this, their, their old ideas and they will continue to, to wage their war with us, I'm afraid. That is, unfortunately, um, what we'll be dealing with in the, the years to come. Thank you. So I want to ask a question to each of you and then I'll open it up to the audience, which I'm sure has a lot of questions because those were two very interesting presentations. Um, so you mentioned that the difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS recruiting. It sounds like basically the general idea is ISIS is a lot less uh, restrictive about who they will take in. Uh, and you know, certainly we've seen this in the, the inspired, the Islamic State inspired attacks or inspired by Islamic State. Uh, how, if you look going forward, does that dilute IS's ability to to propagate messages when the message becomes so diluted, if when they're willing to take on people from all different areas and people with different beliefs, does the message then not become, become less powerful than Al-Qaeda's message was before? Uh, to use sort of German terminology, Al uh, ISIS is definitely the Islamic State is more the multi culti terrorist organization uh, than Al-Qaeda ever was. Um, a big part of this is that they were able structurally from the beginning to compartmentalize uh, what new recruits would, would do. In Al-Qaeda's case, because of the experience of the Muslim Brotherhood networks and previous Islamic organizations, secrecy and being tight-knit and close was really the most important aspect. But because they had territorial grounds and because they operated so openly on the internet, they could keep people kind of an arm's length and they also were expecting people to be in intelligence or to trying to subvert them, right? So the Iraqi commanders um, and the experienced insurgents kept the security uh, um, affairs very close to the chest, but they opened up the propaganda uh, and the recruitment stuff to open for anyone. Um, and on the other hand, um, the thing that they actually even opened up the security side was when they allowed foreign fighters from Indonesia and from other places to, to join them even early on in 2014. And some of these guys were actually mercenaries who were on, on, in the ground in Iraq for due to private military contractors and so forth. They switched sides early in the conflict uh, or early in their time there. Um, and I think Anything that happens after ISIS will, in a sense, be an, an improvement if you can think of the Islamic State as Al-Qaeda 2.0, whatever the 3.0 would probably even be more open, but also probably more compartmentalized. Um, that I would see those two trends being kind of exacerbated, that if the uh, terrorist actual network attacks would be more closer uh, to the chest, so to speak, and to be more dramatic, and those that are inspired, they would give them, in a way, better instructions to do them on their own, completely in isolation. Which is actually an innovation that predates uh, the Islamic State by Ayman al-Awlaki, who is kind of the, one of the ideological fathers of the Islamic State as well. So the, when you say compartmentalize, so the, the individual groups or networks are able to operate independently of ISIS because of that loose control. It changes now, of course, because they have no, or not much of a territorial base, but it seemed to me that when they did have the territorial control that uh, the people that they trusted in the front lines were the ones that were, who proved themselves um, over time. It wasn't just like the new recruit fresh off the boat. The new recruit fresh off the boat would have a role in like the propaganda campaign or in other areas, um, administrative or whatever, but it wasn't in a way security oriented. Um, um. So you were mentioning the, the fact that you know, there's some of the British and American foreign fighters like Jihadi John got a lot of media attention, but really when we're looking at where people are coming from uh, is Western Europe and, and in particular Belgium. So Peter, I wanted to ask you, 
um, it's quite striking when you showed a lot of those photos and you know the majority of the people in the photos are coming from Belgium. Um, what is what are the factors behind why so many of the foreign fighters are coming from Belgium? Um, well, very first, we shouldn't underestimate the, um, the influence of the networks like Sharia for Belgium. Sharia for Belgium, at a, at a certain point when they were, were very active in the streets of Antwerp preaching there and engaging themselves with the so-called street dawa, the Belgian government, they turned a blind eye and they, they called them clowns and strange people and they, they basically, well, they ignored them. And, but these guys were actively recruiting and not only in Antwerp, as I said, but all the way down to Brussels. They, it, it, basically, everywhere where they could, they started recruiting people. And then when the very first wave of um, the hardcore Sharia for Belgium guys went over to, to join um, Majlis Shuret al-Mujahideen, we see a very, very important role of social media. I'm not saying that everybody, in the, uh, the majority of these guys have been recruited via social media, but we, can, we definitely see how important social media was. We don't even know exactly how many of them have been recruited actively via social media. But uh, it appealed to those guys. Um, if you look at, for example, the words of Fuad Belkassen, uh, there's a text on my website. Um, it was an 11-page text published by Fuad Belkassen, sm somehow smuggled out of prison. Don't ask me how he did it. Basically, in it he wrote, we as Moroccans, we don't feel ourselves at home here in Belgium. We feel like second rank civilians. We don't feel at home in Belgium. We, we are, when we are in Belgium, we are regarded as Moroccans, but if we go to Moroccan, Morocco, then we are regarded as Belgians. Belgians. So we don't belong any, anywhere. And that's why the appeal of the Islamic State was so big, because it was such a multi uh, organization with a strong sense of brotherhood. And uh, if, you, if you look at one of the videos, for example, of the Islamic State, where, they, where they, uh, the mass killing of about 20, 25 uh, Syrian soldiers somewhere in the Syrian desert, um, these guys didn't wear any masks. And they were guys from very different nationalities. It wasn't so important on who they actually were. The more important thing was to show we are all equal, we're all brothers, we're all doing the same thing. And, and that appealed to a lot of these guys. Um, and yeah, well, the factors named by uh, Fort Belkassim in his text are uh, from economical, uh, social, sociological things, problems, that, uh, name it and you got it. But there is no such thing as the profile of the um, Belgian foreign fighters, for example. We also had a guy from Antwerp who was an accountant, he sold his, his, his business, he sold his house, he sold his car, and he went with all his family to Syria. They're still living there somewhere. Um, then we have the son of a university professor of my university at the, uh, the University of Leuven who basically left home um, and he joined the Islamic State. So we have a variety of profiles that, that have joined. Proportionally, would you say that most of the people being recruited in Belgium are going through groups like Sharia for Belgium or are they being directly recruited through social media completely independently? Well, as the security of the state in Belgium also has concluded, um, Sharia for Belgium and Resto du Tawhid were catalysts. They were basically the, 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 the spark that had been lit, if you can understand me. Sorry to refer to uh, Zarqawi's phrasing in Dabik, but that's basically what happened. These groups lit the spark, and that's what inspired more and more people in, in Belgium to go over, especially when you, when you look at the, peri the, star, uh, sorry, the period of the five-star jihad. It was appealing. Life was luxurious back then in, in northern Aleppo, in, in Hama, in Idlib province, and they all went over because they were promised heaven on earth, an Islamic state in brotherhood. That was the, the thing that appealed to them most. Let's take some questions from the audience. Does anybody want to ask a first question? Yep, got one on the right over here. She's coming around with the mic. If you could say your name first before your question. Hey, Nicholas, we know each other. Um, 
a question to Peter. Um, you spoke about the importance of uh, the networks for the recruitment, especially the role played by Sharia for Belgium. My question is, uh, since you have been following this group for some time, even before the start of the, the jihad in a military meaning uh, in uh, 2011 or 2012, um, what was Sharia for Belgium recruiting for? Did they know originally when they started just chatting with uh, youngsters in the street, what was the aim, the final aim of this recruitment? What, where they would take these guys to? Well, Sharia for Belgium is a, is a branch that was a sub-branch basically of Islam for UK led by Ayman uh, Chaudhary. Uh, Sharia for Belgium was created as the name said itself to, cr to create, um, yeah, to basically introduce Sharia in Belgium. They wanted a broad network of youngsters that would preach and recruit as many people as possible and convince them of the fact that Belgium was, uh, how should I say, a, de a nation in deprivation. That, the, that well, how should I say, maybe the words, I can, I can use the, the words of a guy who tweeted me recently. He, first, he said, at first you were all, um, pragmatists and you did whatever was possible and um, you didn't care about the Muslim communities in Belgium and now you're turning into fascists. That's, ba that's basically what I've been told recently on Twitter and he, he basically says that we are, Western civilization is a civilization in decline and they wanted to do something about that by introducing Sharia in, not only in Belgium, but you also had a sister organization in Holland, Sharia for Holland. And they, that was their ultimate aim, and as, as soon as they found out that that was going to fail miserably, they, uh, they, they saw their opportunity in, in, uh, in Syria, and they ceased, uh, ceased the day, and they just went over. That was the whole thing. Another question? Anybody? Yeah, Tatiana. Get the mic coming here. Yeah, I'm curious uh, about the fact uh, that you discuss, uh, especially to Peter, um, this idea of the openness of the Islamic State uh, online. Um, and especially, I wonder if they don't uh, imagine that people would do like you did to create fake profile to infiltrate them. So I wonder is actually something that they know, but they still think is important to be open to have more people following, or how do they deal with this problem? Well, of course, they never uh, they never found out who I was. Uh, Abu Battal el Belgiki died because I couldn't provide uh, an identity card. But that's basically the whole thing. Facebook was a, a bit alarmed by my profile and by the fact that I had 1,400 contacts. Um, Facebook shut down my profile. I never reopened another profile. No, basically, Abu Battal al Belgiki the second was created, but he only lasted like two weeks or something before Facebook shut him down as well. And actually, I hate Facebook. I never used it again. Um, the creation of the fake profile for me was just like scraping their information. The majority of my research was based on open sources and, well, call it, um, how can you, Basically, social media played a very important role. The, the profiling of, of the majority of the Belgian fighters in our database was based on open source material. Their Facebook profiles, their Twitter profiles, even things they told us in private um, in 2013, 14, and even up till 15. I had like, I can't, can't really say, maybe 30, 40 guys who contacted me regularly, all Islamic State fighters. Um, I was, for example, I was in contact with um, the guys from Portsmouth um, who went over and at a certain point they didn't speak any Arabic. At a certain point, he, uh, one of the guys DM'd me and he said, hey bro, can you help me with an Arabic translation because I, I don't speak any Arabic. Um, it was, they, they were very, very open in the very beginning. But then as soon as, the, uh, as they started beheading Westerners, the first one of them, James Foley, then the whole situation uh, completely changed. 
Um, when the international coalition started bombing them, um, they received strict orders to stop talking to people like me. So now it's very rare that I can find an Islamic State operative or a fanboy that is willing to talk to me, but I do have, luckily I do have some, some sources left. But there were, for me as well as a researcher, I know it's not, maybe not completely ethical, but it was, yeah, it was like heaven on earth for a researcher. If you wanted to find out about the early days of, Bel of Belgian fighters and what happened in the very early days, the majority of that story was reconstructed thanks to um, the information I got from uh, a few Dutch and a few Belgians in the ranks of Jabhat al-Nusra who were up till recently very, very open uh, to me and, and disclosing all kind of details. But they, I mean, do they take precautions against people infiltrating? Because it, it must be a very secretive group. I mean, do they... Are they concerned that there are interlopers well, within it? Right now, obviously, they are. Um, uh, a while ago, I talked to, at a certain point, Jadaun, the last one I, I, I showed you, uh, was declared dead, uh, that, he was, uh, that he had been killed in Mosul. Um, but there was also a fear that he might have faked his own death and that he was returning to Belgium to execute the so-called operation that everybody was afraid of. And, an American fighter um, chatted with me on, on Telegram and he gave me instructions to set uh, the chat with him on auto-destruct within one minute and stuff like that. And he basically gave me a lot of details about Jadaun, which seemed very, very credible based on the information we already had. But then at a certain point he said, yeah, and I'm pretty sure the brother has been killed. And by the way, do you know this guy? I said, um, no, never heard of him, although I know him. Why? Well, at a certain point I was having um, a talk with three brothers about an operation and he joined our chat. And who the hell is he and what did he do with in that information? So yeah, now they are very, very aware, but they were very naive in the very beginning. I even remember a certain point when four British fighters were supposed to meet each other at a, an internet cafe uh, uh, around the, the roundabout in Raqqa, uh, you know, the f very famous roundabout where they had their tour with the tanks and whatever. One of these British fighters, he was so stupid to leave, to leave his location services on. They were chatting in public. And at a certain point, one of the Brits said, hey, bro, we have been standing here for half an hour. Where are you? And Back at the bottom, there were the coordinates of where he stood. So I could track him down to 10 meters in Raqqa. At that point, nobody used that information. Nobody did anything with that. I've seen some very, very stupid things by these guys. Do we have another question from the audience? Yep, over here. Hello, my name is Karam Hamad. I'm from Syria. Um, it's a question for Saud. With the continuous losses for ISIS right now inside Syria, recently there have been an, a new wave of um, former ISIS fighters who are moving either through SDF areas or through regime areas towards Aleppo and then towards Idlib. Some of them are being welcomed by HTS or other groups. And it was interesting hearing the differences in um, the way ISIS before was recruiting people when it comes to what you, uh, what you talked about when it comes to non-Arabs and Arabs. It would be also interesting to hear your opinion about the role of those newcomers to Idlib and their role in Idlib in the future and how do you see yourself the future of Idlib if um, right now HTS have been, rec like also recently they formed a new government in a way and Turkey is or might be uh, trying to enter Idlib in the future. So how do you see the future of Idlib? I think um, a good way to think about it is to think it, think it through the actual history of uh, uh, the Islamic State in Syria. The transition of people who were willing to, from desperate groups to unite uh, in one Jebha, as it were, and not like even leave Jabhat al-Nusra and consider the old legacy of Al-Qaeda as something obsolete, right? That this um, dynamism, this ability to change um, not just allegiances but realize what the bigger goal is, 
yeah, in this regard, the uh, Bashar al-Assad, and to be anti-American at the same time. So these are the flip sides of the equation. But they have to kind of ask themselves, like, what is the more immediate threat? Is it the Russian bombings? Is it, the Amer is it Trump behind, uh, with, with Trump as president? And this is the kind of the question for Idlib, right? Is like, what is the imminent threat? What is going to be uh, the more important enemy, as it were? And it's, I think, a really difficult uh, thing to actually predict. We've discussed the complexities of making any uh, judgment about this. But if it does survive, it will have to um, evolve in, in a way that, that realizes the parameters of survival and probably no longer a territorial five-star experience. And the five-star experience was unique uh, because of the fundraising from the Arab Spring and because of the black market in oil, which we are now seeing being reduced. If you want to think of Russia's involvement, a big part of it is because of the low price of oil. Is that because the black market oil coming through Turkey was, raising, was lowering the price of oil uh, uh, for Russia and, and, and making it difficult to unload Russian oil. Um, since we don't have that dynamic anymore, I do think if there is any territorial gains, it will be small and it will be very uh, precarious at best in, in the case of Idlib. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that answers your question and much sympathy. <laughs> I think we have time for, or did you have something to add? Yeah, I've just, uh, what is the, the future for the situation of Idlib? Grim, one word, grim, very grim. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> Do we have time for, uh, we have time for one more question. Yep, up here. Hi, I'm Jonas. Um, I was wondering about the difference between recruitment of foreign fighters and recruitment of suicide bombers, for example, because from what I remember a bit of like the work of Scott Atran, for example, of uh, covering, like researching all the known suicide bombers and talking to families, etc. It seems we know a lot there. And, uh, but like the prospects of someone becoming a foreign fighter, there's a, you can imagine a, a lot of adventure and utopianism there, while if you're deciding to become a suicide bomber in Europe at home, it's, uh, yeah, it's not as uh, exciting a prospect, it's a bit more grim. But I wonder what we, like, do we know anything, yeah, to, to compare these things? If we see these, like, 600 people, for example, going as foreign fighters, have we any clue how that relates to how many would be, uh, you know, could be recruited for, for uh, an attack that doesn't have all these uh, foreign adventures involved? Yeah, there seem to be two diopposed messages when you have the guys in the swimming pool, you're going to come here and live a great life, and then the other message saying you should become a martyr. Well, but don't, don't forget that the guys in the swimming pool was before the creation, well, well it's around the creation of ISIS as well, but it was before the whole thing started to turn very uh, murky for them. Um, basically, we do know, of course, we do, everybody heard of, about the ISIS intake documents. Um, and that they had three options to, to point out. They wanted to become a fighter, they wanted to become an Inrimazi, some kind of a, um, how should I say, an Inrimazi would, would be the best way to. Um, Inrimazi, how do you? An Inrimazi. Inrimazi. Yeah. Um, a shock attacker, something like a stormtrooper. Compare it to that. Guys who fight themselves to death. Third option was um, suicide bomber. Only a very small uh, group marked the option suicide bomber, and we don't have for all the seven, I, all the, the majority of the Belgians, the seventy percent of my population. We've the, we've been uh, um, researching. We only know for a handful of them what option did they, they have encircled because we don't have the documents on them. I do hope that at some point, um, well, these documents will, will be found and will be available for research. But uh, I have no idea, to, to be very honest, I have no idea how many went, to, went for the, the suicide attack option. Um, overall, we now, right now have 130 Belgian fighters that have been killed in the conflict and only a handful of them were suicide bombers.
around five to ten or something. But the majority that just died in battle. I'm very sorry I can't give you any more detail. But do you think they were expecting to die in battle? Well, some of them obviously did, but um, I, think, I think, as I said before, there were a lot of naive people as well who, who left for Syria in 2012, 2013. As I said, the five-star jihad, everything was beautiful, life was glorious. Yeah, so even in the days of the uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, phase, when they took recruits that seemed very gung-ho about uh, doing istishhad missions, doing sh uh, um, uh, suicide missions, what they would actually do, the uh, Iraqi commanders of Al-Qaeda at the time, would tell them that, hey, we're just going to give you like a very basic job of driving a truck from point A to point B. And uh, between point A and point B, there would sometimes be a uh, Shia shrine, and then they would explode him remotely. And so even if he was a spy, he would be eliminated. If he wanted to be a martyr, well, they provided him with martyrdom. So this was the very kind of cold period as well that the Sunni-Shia conflict uh, was being enraged by people who probably didn't even know that they were on a suicide mission, but they signed up for it. So um. I want to close out the discussion with a quick question to each of you. We've heard some of the factors that are motivating people to be susceptible to these messages. What's the solution? Obviously, this is a very complicated issue, but is there anything that governments can do or societies to try to... I mean, I think that the central thing is that, we, that you both talked about was people feeling homeless and that IS offers these people a home uh, both ideologically and, in the case of Syria, sometimes geographically. But what can be done? I genuinely think the application of the rule of law uh, is, is actually the best option. I think that there is always going to be a certain element of um, politically radicalized violence that is at a lower scale. I think the thing that really gets people to enable or to allow this thing to grow in their communities is the perception that there's a double standard and that there's a lot of hypocrisy. Uh, the killing of Ayman al-Awlaki with a drone strike, even though he was an American citizen without trial, is the one that really stands out currently. So addressing that, uh, I've, I've discussed this in previous talks, but a kind of a larger truth and reconciliation about the war on terror for the Middle East as a broader discussion about, hey, what is the actual purpose of these regulations for travel? Yeah. Is it economic, is it, if it's going to be things like uh, insecurity about uh, immigration and so forth, then you can put measures of people putting financial deposits and so forth. Uh, the barriers of entry and exit are fueling this in an indirect way that a lot of people who are genuinely have no place else to go end up uh, uh, there, like in the case of Jihadi John. Um, and really, I think it's, it's one of the most obvious but the most powerful ones that uh, we can possibly have. And I always recommend for people to think that anti-war isn't a pacifist dream, it's actually the solution to no war. Um, and we're in a, in a stalemate, especially in the Obama years, we all felt a little disappointed when he said he was going to close down Guantanamo and he was going to w withdraw troops that he actually in a way escalated the struggle into the surgical strike drone domain and the New York Times report just recently about how actually ineffe uh, ineffective those are at reducing civilian casualties. Apparently it's three times more than the uh, uh, military itself has so yeah, I think rule of law, the application of the rule of law at the end of the day. Peter, what about you, particularly for Belgium? Um, well, a few weeks back, Morocco qualified itself for the World Cup. The reaction in Brussels was rioting. An entire neighborhood was torn to pieces by Moroccan youth. Um, police hardly knew what to do with that. Two days later, another riot in Brussels, another, more destruction. It's the same breeding ground, actually. The problems still persist in Belgium, and I don't think our government is doing such a good job in preventing that. All the measures that have been taken since uh, the foiled flot a plot on in Verviers, <coughs> uh, the attacks in Paris, and then later on the attacks in Brussels, have all been focused on the very short-term measures and very oppressive measures but they're not investing in the long term. They're not cleaning up Molenbeek. 
they're not investing in schooling, in housing, in education, in integration, what have you. Our, the model of our society in Belgium is, well, thoroughly rotten. It isn't, it isn't a good prospect in Belgium, actually. I'm very sorry, but... <laughs> Depressing note to end on, especially for people who live in Belgium. But uh, I want to thank you both for a very interesting discussion. That was uh, learned a lot. A uh, round of applause for our panelists. And I'd like to turn it over to Tatiana with some messages.